but what do I do? I'm not going to die, but what do I do, you know? Why won't you take me? I threw a, a little fit there in the in the sand and screaming and writhing around, crying my eyes out. The sand was cool and I was very hot. I started digging into it and rolling around and started to feel cooler and feeling better a little bit. And that settled me down. I was stopped crying, stopped throwing a fit. And just shortly after that, almost audible was a thought, go dig. Go dig in a valley, you'll find water. And uh, I hit it just before nightfall. I dug out the hole so I could sit in there and got a bed sheet, water containers, and just sat in that hole all night. I'd take the tuna can and just drink. That was a good night. Robert's original plan was to spend a week fasting and meditating at the McClarty Hills. He now realizes he's gone way off course. So I decided that, well, why don't I just sit down here and do what I was going to do at the McClarty Hills, but just do it here. It's a beautiful place. And that was to sit down for a week and just be out there in solitude. With the search now called off, in Los Angeles, Ray and Betty Baguki refused to give up hope for their son. Jeff Fuller informed me that uh, another search group was going to come over. It had been arranged and planned for by Robert's parents, and all of us understood that this was for body retrieval. Ray asked, would I be offended if he sent in this group? Well, I was never going to be offended. He could have brought in the militia. I didn't care. I wanted to find him as much as anyone else. And if these fellows could come in and do a better job or do a job which was different to what we were doing, then fine, let's go with it. I knew it was very important to his parents, so I didn't have anything to say about it, but I didn't want to be there while it was happening. As Janet left, having said her farewells, she uh, took me aside and said very quietly to me, the Green Berets are coming. The special response group specialise in rapid deployment. They're hired to find missing Americans in foreign countries, both living and dead. Well, the police have done a very good job with what they had. Uh, they're law enforcement and they do the occasional search, okay? We have members on this team who do 40 to 50 searches a year. But police are worried the Americans are rushing into foreign country they know nothing about. With emergency dispensation from Australian quarantine, the American volunteers land in Broome with their dogs. Morning, gentlemen. They're met by Jeff Fuller and briefed on the dangers of the Great Sandy Desert. They were led by a chap called Garrison St. Clair, and he was a five foot nothing with a shaved head. He wore big sunglasses and camouflage pants and uh, smoked a big fat cigar. He refused to answer to the name Garrison when he was on radio. He would only go by the handle Gunslinger and he was really strict about that. The TV stations from around Australia and the world absolutely lapped it up. He was a born performer. It went from being something that, uh, that me and a photographer were following, you know, sort of from day one, effectively, into a full-blown circus. There was reporters from London, you know, Dateline NBC from America was on the phone. Everyone wanted to know what was going on. All three dogs are trained to search for a cadaver. There's certainly some question in everyone's mind whether Mr. Baguki is still alive at this point. Local expert George Morris is hired by the Americans. 
No, I don't think they had any idea at all what they were getting themselves into. They had some bloodhound dogs, which said, by some miracle, had managed to get into Australia in a big hurry. I don't know how they got them through normal doggy quarantine, but they did. Now, have you actually made these with dogs before? Uh, yeah, every week I make hundreds of them. <laughs> A key player in the American team is Joel Hardin, a tracker with 30 years' experience. I need to know what he was thinking. In order to recognize that those footprints, I need to know the character that I would be looking for. Joel contacts Janet for information before she leaves the country. She said, well, number one, he is not a kook. He's not the person that he has been painted to be in the media reports. So it gave me an entirely different mental picture of the man that I would be following. Out in the desert, Robert's week of rest has come to an end. I was heading back to Alaska, basically, and thought, I'm ready to go. I had my rest seven days. I'm leaving this desert now. He's now been four weeks without food and exhausted his water supply once more. Subsequent attempts to find water have failed. My mantra was just one foot in front of the other. Just keep doing it. Just keep going. Consumed by thirst, Robert resorts to desert flowers for nourishment. I went ahead and started tasting these flowers and just sucking the nectar out. After 30 days without food, the sudden sugar rush from the flowers sends Robert's body into shock. As the nectar breaks down in Robert's stomach and intestines, his heart rapidly pumps the sugar around his body, where it starts to cause disorientation. I started feeling nauseous, stomach aches, sick, really lightheaded and distressed. And I thought, maybe I should sit down. Immediately the thought was, if you sit down here, you're going to die. And that was fear. That was the only time that fear hit me. Out of the blue, just waiting there, it just hit me. I decided that I just need to keep walking. Meanwhile, George Morris knows of a track that will give the Americans a shortcut into the search area. If he had kept heading north, at some stage he would have to intersect this track if he'd managed to survive, so that would be an apt place to go to start looking for him. Having struggled through almost impenetrable bush for days, Robert stumbles upon a track. It's clear, and there's no bushes on it, and there's tire marks on it, and I figured that's the road I'm looking for. I just follow this road, and I'm golden. I couldn't really talk because my throat was so dry. I could squeak out a few things. And now I'm... The rest of the convoy approaches the search area, where they make a miraculous discovery. George and I were traveling in a, in a four-wheel drive at the front of the convoy. Obviously, George was leading the convoy into the desert. Eventually, we got to a point where we got a bit ahead of the crew, so I thought it was a fairly good place to stop and wait for everyone to catch up. While we were standing there, I looked down the track and I thought I saw footprints. Now, I'm no tracker, but they looked like footprints to me. And quite fresh ones of that. Yeah, I nearly fell over, I couldn't believe it. There was only one possible suspect and that was Robert. 